rabbits. Nature made them adorable, but when you're so adorable, it's pretty hard to defend yourself. That is, when push comes to shove, rabbits can stand on their hind legs, start scratching or fighting, but they're still rabbits. Their most common behavioral strategy when seeing a predator is fleeing right away. Also, the rabbits can play dead. This behavior is triggered by a strong fear. The animal immediately lies on its back and remains completely still until the danger's gone. But there's a little problem here. Coyotes that prey on rabbits are scavengers. So if they were going to catch dinner and that dinner turned out to be dead, coyotes won't mind. It's even more convenient this way. No need to waste energy, just grab and eat it. Yes, rabbits realize what predators do and usually try not to put on a show in front of the coyotes, but everyone makes mistakes. Besides, a rabbit can play dead just out of desperation hoping for the best, but when it comes to coyotes, there's definitely nothing to hope for. Of course, not only rabbits play dead, this is actually a fairly common strategy among many creatures, from birds to fish, but I definitely didn't expect it from ducks. Back in 1975, scientists carefully observed how captive foxes preyed on five different duck species. Most of the birds were attacked from behind or from the side. The ducks immediately feigned death and stayed motionless, sometimes for 14 minutes straight. This is a carefully planned strategy because foxes don't eat prey right on the spot. They carry the birds to their dens and usually put them near the entrance to eat later. Well, the fox only has to look away so that the duck suddenly comes to life and flies away. This only works with young foxes who don't know yet how to handle prey and where to bite to prevent dinner from disappearing from right under their noses. But all these animals that play dead have one thing in common. This is conscious behavior. Myotonic goats are not quite as lucky. This is an American goat breed with myotonia congenita, a hereditary condition that causes temporary paralysis of all muscles. At some point, the goat's muscles stiffen when it gets scared. It stands still and falls on its side while still conscious. They say the shepherds even used fainting goats to protect the sheep. When a wolf attacked a herd, the goat fainted from fear. And while the predator was busy with it, the sheep managed to escape. In short, that's a questionable feature that's detrimental to the goats themselves. But what can you do? Developing some kind of cool strategy against predators takes an effort. Fish, for example, have learned to fly. Well, almost. Flying fish leap from the water and soar above the surface for up to 45 seconds. Moreover, they can accelerate up to 19 miles per hour and jump up to 26 feet above sea level. They do that to escape from overly fast underwater predators. To avoid being eaten after landing, flying fish immediately pick up speed and erupt out of the water again. They can do this at least 12 times in a row. Looks like a great strategy, but as usual, with one small hiccup. As soon as flying fish rise high enough, they immediately become a target for frigate birds. That is, you escaped from one predator to be eaten by another. Well, so that flying fish finally realize they shouldn't drop their guard, here's a fact. The ability to fly can bring fish on land. Not in evolutionary terms, I mean literally. From time to time, they end up on the coast by pure accident, choosing the wrong flight trajectory. So that's how these fish are killed by their own unique skill. No, it was the gravity that killed him. Electric eels aren't doing very well either. They generate electricity for hunting and defense, and the standard electric current of an adult eel is enough to stun almost any animal. But with great power comes great responsibility. If you shock others, you may get electrocuted as well. Eels zap themselves both in the wild and in aquariums. It doesn't happen too often, but still. Also, some eels may be shocked by other eels, and such an accidental discharge may actually kill the eel if the current passes through its heart. The more confined the pond, the greater the risk of one eel bumping into another, and then… But the eel can also harm itself if you pull it out of the water. That is, the eel, of course, will try to shock the one who pulled it out, but the charge doesn't travel through the air. Instead, the electricity will travel along the wet skin of the eel and rumors say this causes the eels to convulse. According to the book by the American naturalist Cy Montgomery, porcupines have a similar problem. Well, that's unexpected. It's not like they can shock themselves. Porcupines just prick each other with their quills. An adult porcupine can have 30,000 quills. They're damn sharp. So porcupines try to be as careful as they can. 
If a porcupine enters a den it shares with others, it chirs and squeaks to warn others. Does it help? Not always. But nature has foreseen this scenario. Every porcupine has some sort of health insurance. Their quills contain a natural antibiotic that slows down the growth of bacteria. So even if a porcupine is hurt by the quills of another porcupine, the wound won't get infected. It'll just hurt and feel quite nasty. And as is usually the case, while naturalists are amazed by porcupine quills with antibiotics, various tribes have long understood what's what. For example, they believe porcupine quills help relieve toothache. Only for this, they need to be turned into ashes. In addition, they help with bloating and various muscle diseases. That's more like a walking pharmacy than an animal. Well, porcupines don't seem to have anything to complain about, unlike tiger beetles. There are 2,600 species of these long-legged predatory insects, and the fastest of them can run at 5 miles per hour. They cover 120 of its body lengths in a single second. Tiger beetles use their incredible speed to hunt and look for females, but when they run, they just don't have time to look around. You get it, right? Their eyes can't gather enough light to form an image. As a result, everything around is blurry and the beetle can't see a thing. Remember that dog Quicksilver saved? The tiger beetles probably feel the same way. To understand where it's running and where its goal is, the beetle must stop, look around, and only then keep running. A typical joke of evolution. Make a cool, super-fast predator who loses sight of prey while chasing it. It also bumps into all sorts of stuff along the way, because at speeds like that, it's impossible to avoid colliding with an obstacle. But the beetle seems to do just fine. They still catch prey, attract females, and they're already used to constant collisions. We can say they've adapted to this gift of evolution. Japanese tits aren't that lucky. If a snake approaches their nest, these birds start making noise to warn each other. In response to this alarm call, everyone who can fly takes off, including chicks. As soon as the danger's gone, the birds return. Seems like a great strategy. But corvid predators understand what these alarm calls mean. When corvids hear them, they fly closer to the nest of tits to have fledgling nestlings for a snack. It's easy prey, so why not take advantage of it? By the way, the call recognized by the corvids is used only when a snake is nearby. Japanese tits don't react like that to any other predator. Bird calls are generally a complicated topic. The chicks make loud noises so that their parents feed them. At the same time, predators eavesdrop on them to locate the nest, so what should the birds do about that? Birds have something like a social network. A number of species use it to share predator alerts with each other. And this is not just information like, careful, I see a fox. Birds can specify how big a predator is, where it is, and even what it's doing and they all speak the same universal language. Scientists have somehow reproduced the alarming call of the black-capped chickadee in various regions around the globe, and the signal was understood everywhere, even where there are no black-capped chickadees. Still, my favorite animals in terms of unsuccessful adaptations are slow lorises. They're cute, fluffy, and always seem to be a little shocked by what's happening. They're also venomous. A bite from a loris is no joke. They have glands underneath their armpits, which secrete a noxious oil. And when they lick these glands, the saliva mixes with the oil to concoct venom. It goes into their grooved canines, and from there it penetrates the body of the enemy, and the slow lorises bite very hard. Seems like they probably need this to protect themselves from predators? Like snakes? Well, maybe it used to be like that at first, but today's slow lorises bite each other. They just fight and don't hesitate to use venom. Although it's very strong, it literally makes the flesh rot. Some afflicted lorises have even been seen with half their faces melted off. And since I mentioned snakes several times, here's a story that seems absolutely incredible. In November 2014, snake catcher Matt Hagen was called in to deal with the brown tree snake. But when he arrived at the scene, he discovered that the snake had already died, after biting itself. 
Those who've been watching our videos for a while will surely be outraged now because snakes are supposed to be immune to their own venom. And it's true. But sometimes immunity works slower than toxins. And the toxins of the brown tree snake work very, very fast. But why did the snake bite itself in the first place? Well, experts believe the snake was injured internally and was simply trying to address the source of the pain. Many snakes do this. They bite the one who hurt them. So, yeah, in theory the snake could actually die from its own venom. But Steve and I will explore this in more detail. See you later.